Greetings, and welcome to the basement. Continuing on with our efforts to make a simple little game in Unity, we are going to put some obstacles in. Asteroids, at last, to dodge around. Well, I say asteroids, they're, they're, they're just going to be spheres. But still, obstacles that we have to move around. So how are we going to do this? Well, I mean, the spheres themselves are brain-dead simple. I'm just going to come in here to the hierarchy. I'm going to right-click 3D object and drop in a sphere, which I'm going to call a rock. And then notice that my caps lock is on and go back and fix it. Again, it has created this wherever my editor camera is currently focused. That's not where I want it. And so I am going to reset it. I'm going to move it forward. Take a look in the game window. Okay, yep, that looks good. Now, the goal here is that when I move my ship into this sphere, the ship will disappear. The collision will be detected, the ship will disappear, and I will output a message to the console, which will show up right here, saying, you lose. Simple enough. Now, there's a couple of things we need to do, though, first. The, the rock is fine. Since the rock isn't going to be moving, all it needs is a collider, which is automatically included with the sphere. As you can see here, I've got a sphere collider, which is going to perfectly match the sphere mesh that is currently being used. So the rock is done. The ship, not quite so much because the ship has to move. And it has colliders in the body, left engine, and right engine. But anytime you want to move colliders in Unity and you don't want strange things happening, it needs to be a rigid body. It needs to have the rigid body component attached. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, when you have a hierarchy like this, you only need one rigid body. I would not put a rigid body on each of these components unless I was doing something very crazy and I actually wanted these three things to be simulated objects, which in this case wouldn't work anyways because they're embedded with one another. They, are, they would explode instantly. Instead, all I need is one rigid body on the parent object. So on the ship here, I'm going to add component. And I'm going to add a rigid body to it. Now, info by default will not be expanded. By default, you will see info collapsed. But there's a lot of very useful debug information to keep your eye on here. So I generally find it good to expand that out on a rigid body, especially when I'm first developing its logic. Now, if we were to hit the play button here, things aren't going to work out so hot. Yeah, my ship's going to fall away. There's a couple of things here that we need to change. The first is use gravity. I don't want gravity to be applied. I want this entire game to take place in the XZ plane. I do not want to be using up and down at all. So I do not want gravity to apply. That also means coming here into constraints, I am going to want to freeze some things. I am going to want to freeze the Y position. That means even if another object hits my ship, it's not going to move in the y-axis. The physics, the physics engine, mind you, I still have the ability to do this in code, but the physics engine will not move it in the y-axis. And even though it's not really going to be much of a concern, I should probably also do something about the rotation. Because while I can still move the ship around, as you can see, that doesn't 
really control very well. Like I said, it's not going to be much of an issue for this particular project because the ship is going to be destroyed as soon as I touch anything. But still, I don't want that to happen. So I am also going to freeze all of my rotations. I don't want the physics engine rotating this object. Furthermore, because I'm paranoid, I am going to change my mass drag and angular drag to 999. Basically, I am saying this is a horrifically massive object. It has a horrific amount of drag to it, and it has a horrific amount of angular drag to it. Pretty much meaning any accidental input that the physics engine gets to this object is going to be crushed underneath the mass and drag of this object. It's overkill. Probably doesn't need to be done. But I am paranoid. And it's never a bad thing to be paranoid. Now that I have the physics constructed for the ship, I need to get the logic applied to it. Now, I could use the same flow graph here, but I would prefer to keep things a little bit simple. Actually, I'm gonna rearrange things here. Compress my size down a little bit so it'll all fit on the one screen here. I wanna keep my movement separate from my collision logic. My movement logic separate from the collision logic. Do I have to do this? No. Could I do this all in one graph? Yes. Visually speaking, I think it looks a little bit cleaner to separate the logic. So I'm going to add another flow machine to this. Also is a good demonstration of how you can have more than one flow machine on an object. I can have as many of these as I want. Though, obviously, once you get past a certain point, you will impact performance. Again, I am not using macros this time around. I want this to be embedded. No, not logic. Collision control is what I want to call this. Now, I don't need a start or an update event. What I need is an on collision event. I need a collision event. So I'm going to right click and I could look under events and there's lots of events under here. Or I know that I want something to do with collision. So I'm going to type in the word collision and see what I have. And sure enough, right up there on the top, on collision, exit, stay, enter. These are the three collision messages that you get. On collision, enter is the very first frame that the collision happens. On collision, exit is the very first frame that the collision isn't happening. And on collision, stay is the frames in between those two messages. So you get one on collision, enter. You get one on collision, exit per collision. And then however many frames of collision you actually have. All I care about is knowing the first frame that the collision happens. So I'm going to do an on collision enter event. Now I'm going to be able to ignore practically all of this information because I only care about two things. I care about printing a message to the console. And I care about destroying the ship so the player can no longer control the game. First, I want to print the message. And it is literally called print. If you want the more formal name for it, it is debug.log. And as you can see, there are a variety of debug log error types or uh, formats that you can use. Debug.log, or the shorthand of print, 
is the most common one that you will do. And this is going to print out a string, which in this case, I'm just going to have it be a string literal. In other words, a hard-coded value. You lose. So this will print the message, you lose, to the console. Now I want to destroy the ship. And as we can see, here we go. I've got object.destroy. I've got two versions. One has a time delay and one is immediate. I'm going to choose the immediate version. Now, what am I destroying? I'm not destroying, even though the icons look the same, I am not destroying this. This information that's being passed in, this collider and data, that's referring to the other thing that I collided with. What I want to destroy is myself. And there is a special reference for that called self. So there you go. The collision is going to happen. I'm going to print this message. And then I'm going to destroy myself. See if that works. Hit the play button. Now watch down here for the message. There we go. My ship disappeared. I get the message you lose. That's all there is to it. Now, of course, I would want to place a couple of these rocks in the scene. Wouldn't be very much fun if I just had the one obstacle, right? And you can notice that it's uh, starting to get a little crowded in my hierarchy over here with all of these rocks. I'm going to clean that up a little bit. Now, this next step has absolutely no functional importance. It just makes things a little bit neater. I'm going to create an empty game object. I'm going to call it underscore rocks. The underscore is nothing important. That is a naming convention that I use to let myself know that this game object doesn't actually have any logic to it. It's just something I'm using to collect other game objects in my scene. I am going to reset its transform. So it's at the origin. I'm going to grab all my rocks and make them a child of my rocks collection. And that helps keep my scene a little bit cleaner. Now at the moment, I can move off screen. I'm gonna have my ship go off screen like that to either side and also off screen down below. I don't want the player to have the ability to do that. Now you might be thinking, oh, well, it's here. Um, yeah, well, maybe I can check like the X and Y coordinates to see whether or not they're exceeding a certain value. Um, or maybe I can do some other fancy check. No, 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 nothing, nothing fancy, nothing fancy. My ship disappears and I lose if I touch a solid object, right? So, for going behind the screen, I'm going to create a cube. I'm going to reset that cube. I'm going to switch to the game view here. And I'm manipulating the Z value. I'm going to move it just off camera. I come back over here to scene so I can better see what I'm doing. I switch to the scale tool. Scale this sucker out. 
And actually, you know what? I should probably... Yep, okay. That covers the hole with the screen. This is a collider. If I try to move backwards, I lose. It's easy as that. Do not overthink your solutions. The user does not care how clever or how ugly your solution is. As long as it works and it works fast, that's all the user cares about. I could do all sorts of fancy checks, try to calculate what this Y value should be. Or I can just put a big old honking cube just outside the view of the camera. Again, this works in this scenario because of the limited camera angle. Might not work in another scenario. You got to play it by ear. Now for uh, the screen here, I want to figure out where my edges are. So I'm going to grab this rock and I am going to position it at the edge there. I'm going to duplicate it. And let's see here. Well, first, where is, let's see here. Let's move it over here. And yeah, I think that's about as far up. Maybe pull it back a little bit. There we go. Now that's sort of the edge of the screen. I can sort of see the angle effect there. And what I want to do because static colliders are very cheap. So I'm just going to keep doing control D, move, control D, move, control D, move. So I have a dense cloud of asteroids over there that I can't get past. There is no way for me to try to sneak past that little field of asteroids until I get up here. But this is going to be my goal, so once I get this far up, I don't care. Although maybe, maybe just for completeness sake, uh, maybe... A few more. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the other side. Uh, let's grab this asteroid and move it. Let's pull it back a little bit to maybe here. There we go. And duplicate it. Move it out. Move it back over. There we go. I've got my line and control D, control D, control D, control D. Just duplicating circles, calling them asteroids, bask in the glory of my incredible level design. Shift those over a little bit. There we go. That's that's better. And maybe, yeah, one one there, one down there. Fill in that empty space a little bit. And there we go. I mean, it's legitimately not going to get me any Game of the Year awards or anything like that. But at least I have to pay some shred of attention. Otherwise, I will die. And there we go. No fancy checks. Just a whole bunch of rocks. 68 of them, 
or 69, including the original, apparently. A whole bunch of rocks and a big old cube at the rear. Now, how am I going to win this? You know what? It's pretty much the same thing as the backdrop here. Uh, so I'm actually going to, well, first I'm going to collapse all my rocks. You can see now why I uh, did this. I can just collapse that and uh, not have to look at all of those. I'm going to take my backstop. I'm going to duplicate it. I'm going to move it forward. Um, let's expand it out a little bit. I want to make sure there's no way the player can miss it. And I am going to make it a little bit thicker there. And let's, yeah, put it right there. That will be my goal. So I'm going to call this goal. But I have a problem. How do I tell the difference between reaching my goal and ramming into an asteroid? Because it's still going to tell me that I lost because I hit a collider. There's a couple of different ways that we could handle this. The way I'm going to handle this is I'm going to change this from being a collider to a trigger volume. Because when you think about the logic here, I'm not actually caring about the fact that did I actually hit this. I'm concerned about did the ship enter into this area? And so I'm going to turn it on to be a trigger a trigger sends a different message than a collider. So now I can go to my ship. I'm going to go to my collision control and edit the graph. And now I'm going to put on an on trigger enter. Again, we have the same three sequence of events. Enter, exit, stay. On trigger behaves the same as on collision. So I'm going to say on trigger enter. I'm actually going to still do this exact same sequence of actions. So I'm going to copy and paste them down here. It's just that instead of printing the message you lose, I'm going to print the message you win and still destroy the player. So that way we know that we successfully got across. Otherwise, it just feels weird if you can reach the goal and get the you win message and then back up and hit an asteroid and get the you lose message. It just doesn't feel right. So I come over here, hit it. Yay, I win. Now, it does look a bit weird having this giant cube here like that. So the final thing I'm going to do before we'll call this project done is I'm going to turn off the mesh renderer for the goal. This doesn't impact anything. The mesh renderer is just visual. The box collider is still there, as we can see by this green outline. And so everything is still going to work. There we go. Now, it can be a little bit disorienting not seeing that unless you have this selected. So what I'm going to do is on this little icon in the inspector, you'll notice we have a little drop down arrow. This allows us to change the icon. So I'm going to change this to the green label icon, which means if I'm close enough, I will see a little green label goal on that. Sadly, depending on how far you are out in the editor, depends, you know, determines how visible certain tags are. So in this particular case, it is of limited use, but it's still better than nothing. At least I can see it once I'm close enough to it. But in this particular case, having a super pulled back camera, eh, I mean, even the camera icon disappears after a moment. But it's better than nothing. 
All right. Save it. Pat yourself on the back. You've got a simple, playable game. It's not much of a looker, but it doesn't need to be. It's nice. It's simple. It's work. You have completed something. That's the important part. Now, if you'll remember, oh, so many hours ago, I mentioned that this is good practice. What you should do is if you are a new developer to Unity, take this sequence of steps and redo it. Set aside an hour, put on some good music, maybe an audiobook, set aside an hour to see how well you can make this from memory. And then the next day, set aside an hour. See how well you can make it from memory. Oh, you made it? See how many times you can make it in an hour. Do this four, five, six times. It's a concept called deliberate practice. This is what musicians do when they practice scales. This is what artists do when they practice shading or line work. It is a very common thing for creatives to have to do deliberate practice. The benefit for this, the benefit behind being bored out of your skull, admittedly, and creating the simple little game five, six, seven times, ten times, ideally, is you get used to the editor. Because at the moment, you're like, okay, um, okay, I need to create a game object. So um, let's see here. That was a hierarchy and I right click um, where, let's see, it was a, a sphere, 3D, okay. All right, there's the sphere. Obviously exaggerating here a little bit, but you get the idea. You're hesitant. It's not fluid. It's not bam, 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 bam. Whereas for me, because I've been doing this for so long, I'm just like, okay, yep, okay. So create a game object, right click 3D sphere. There it is. Right click 3D object cube. There it is. I almost have muscle memory of where exactly I need to go to create these things. That's the advantage. You don't want to have to think about Unity. You don't want to have to think about changing an object's transform, its position, its scale. You don't want to have to think about adding a component, switching windows. You just want to do it. So that way, your mental energy can be focused on the actual creative fun side of game development. That way your mind can be focused on making your games fun. All right. That concludes this video. Now, there are going to be a couple of bonus episodes to this where we're going to take this extremely simple idea and I'm going to add the ship's ability to take two collisions before it dies and I'm going to make the asteroids move. Very simply, but I'm going to make them move. But those will be bonus episodes. This is a done project. Practice this. Get used to it. And things can only get better from here. If you like this video or the whole series, thumbs up would be appreciated. If it's a little bit too basic for you, you didn't learn much, well, the thumbs down button is right next to it. Until next time.